Some of the most exciting things that are happening in cardiology today are on the genetic side. We did a cover story in CardioSource World News on this topic, and we're talking about Myocardia, which is one of the first companies to bring a precision medicine approach to cardiovascular disease. And I am with one of the company's founders, Christine Seidman, MD, who is professor of genetics and medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of the Cardiovascular Genetics Center at Brigham and Women's Hospital, as if you didn't have enough to do. Let's talk about myocardial for a bit. And just Certainly. where'd that come from? What was the, the whole idea, you and your husband getting together and, and, and creating this? Well, we created it with several other very important uh, collaborators, in particular Jim Spudich at Stanford, Leslie Linewan uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder. And all of us had been aware of the fact that the contractile apparatus of the heart, the sarcomere, um, has mutations in it that are fundamentally the cause of two major uh, changes in cardiac remodeling structure, hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy. Those remodeling pathways lead to heart failure and increase the need for transplantation. They increase the risk of significant arrhythmias and the like. And for years, we've been all trying to figure out ways to treat people who have these incredibly deleterious mutations and diseases. There hasn't been much to treat. There's been very, very few treatment options. Uh, and they have been nonspecific. Diuretics, afterload reducing agents, and to a large extent, that's because we have been looking at the symptoms and treating symptoms, but not getting to the root of the problem. And that's where genetics changes the paradigm a little bit. Because if you know that a mutation drives a pathology, at one point you ask, why not fix what that mutation does? Right. Now you're looking at cardiomyopathy in general, but it's also uh, a variety of other things. Let's stick with cardiomyopathy yes. for a moment. In the specifics of what you're doing, what is, what is it you're doing? Okay, so we are looking for allosteric modulators, small molecules that change the function of the sarcomere. We know that mutations also change the function of the sarcomere. In fact, hypertrophic mutations largely increase the power of the sarcomere. Dilated mutations decrease the power of the sarcomere. So, what would happen if a molecule could dampen down the heightened power of the sarcomere? Alternatively, what would happen if another molecule could increase the power of the sarcomere? And that's what the company is focused on discovering and bringing to bear in terms of human patients. So in cardiomyopathy, the effect you'll have is? The effect we would have would be to decrease power if a gene mutation was causing too much power to be produced, and to increase power if too little sarcomere power was produced. Wow. So where are you? We're pretty far along. Um, with regard to dampening down or reducing the sarcomere power, we have identified molecules. They have been tested in rodent models, in dogs, and are now undergoing phase one safety in human patients. We've been to the FDA. They're excited. We're very excited. And um, we think that this will be the first opportunity to directly treat patients with hypertrophic mutations. When we give them to mouse models that have a hypertrophic mutation that's been engineered into them, they have remarkable uh, effects in terms of reducing the hypertrophy and reducing the his, his still pathologic changes that when we see when we section the heart. Those changes are exactly what we see in our human patients. So we think that by going to the primary abnormality the sarcomere that is mutated, the proteins within the sarcomere that are mutated, that we may have considerably more and directed benefit than if we treat patients with downstream consequences of this increased power. So how would the treatment be given? Well, we'd expect it to be given, like most drugs, as an oral agent, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's um, where we are today with that first compound and, and first drug, and we will be certainly using other next generation to improve the specificity, to make them more um, appropriate for patients who have increased power through different mechanisms. The global response is the same, the power is too much, but the subtleties um, may allow us to even improve the specificity of those agents. I mean, usually in medicine they start treating the 
advance cases first and, and do the research there. Is this something that you can foresee as ha maybe having an effect early on? Excellent question. I love it. As it turns out, we know that if you have a gene mutation that causes hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy, that the mutation is there without any clinical manifestations for often more than 10, 20, sometimes even 30 years. Yet if we look carefully at those individuals with those mutations, we see changes in sarcomere performance, either at uh, echocardiographic imaging level, or if we put the mutation into an experimental system, we can do a lot more biochemical analyses of it. So that says that we cardiologists are looking pretty downstream in terms of what we classify as disease. And one of the hypotheses would be if we began earlier, maybe we would be able to prevent some of the secondary changes. So let me give you an example. We know in the hypertrophic scenario that when you increase power, you stimulate the production of molecules that make an increased load of fibrosis in the heart, scar. And that's not good. That can lead to diastolic dysfunction. It can promote arrhythmias. It can propel the heart to fail. And if we could prevent that increased power from stimulating that, maybe those events wouldn't occur. And that would be pretty amazing. So moving the treatment to prevention as compared to really responding to an overt pathology, I think has enormous potential in a whole host of cardiovascular disease, and in particular, those who have genetic drivers. It's always difficult to know timelines, but have you, do you have any idea of what kind of timeline we're talking about for some of this? Well, in terms of the hypertrophic um, uh, agent that we have uh, really in early clinical development, as I say, it's ready for testing in patients today which is very exciting. Assuming the safety is as we expect it will be based on all of our preclinical animal models, we'll then be going into escalating doses and looking for efficacy. Now, myocardia is also looking at, at uh, congenital heart disease, correct? No. I think the, the complexity is that people often um, link a congenital abnormality with a gene mutation that you have inherited. So it's congenital, it's there since the time you're, birth, you're born, but a lot of we cardiologists think of congenital as a malformation of the heart, um, a congenital defect in terms of the structure of the heart. And that is not definitely a focus of myocardia. I'm sorry for that confusion. So so what else are you looking at? Because I saw when I, I did the pull down and I, there were a variety of things there. Yeah. That one caught my eye. The, what the, else is it that you're major, working on? What we are really focusing on is kind of treating biopsy. the mutations in the sarcomere. And, Which um, would also affect what else then? Would definitely affect individuals with poor pump performance, heart failure, okay? And we know that some of those individuals have mutations that decrease the power. And so being able to find other agents that do the opposite of what we see in hypertroph, that actually increase the power, is another goal of the, of the um, company. And certainly we have very, very early molecules that fulfill that bill, and we are pushing hard to be able to really treat, bring those into um, more appropriate molecule structures and formulations so they can also be oral agents to really improve performance. If we can do that, then we don't even need to restrict the kind of patient to those with have gene mutations because we know that pump function is diminished in wide ranges of cardiovascular disease, ischemic cardiomyopathy, individuals who have had you know, revascularization but unfortunately have already had the sequelae of heart attacks and the like. And if we could improve the pump function of those individuals as well, the opportunities are enormous. Well, Deborah Beck wrote a cover story for us on uh, this topic of, we called it heart trek, yeah. you know, kind of the genetics of, of this whole thing. And the, the issue that we keep coming up with is that this has been promised for so many years, but only now are we really starting to see something, and that's why it's like, please, let's talk, because this, yes. is, this yes. is exciting, but we've been hearing about this for years, yeah. and it just kind of yeah. starts to roll over the head. So if I can editorialize from please. a personal perspective, um, we academics, including me and most, I'm a diehard academic, we very much are good at solving puzzles, making discoveries that say, 
this gene has a mutation that causes this disease. And those are very meaningful insights, okay? Then the next thing is how? What's the mechanism? And traditionally, we've been able to do that by putting the mutation into a mouse, growing a cadre of mice, doing the biochemical and the molecular analyses, and ultimately coming up with a pathway. And that has led to lots of opportunities. Yeah. There are downstream consequences from a mutation that have you know, changed the remodeling components of the heart, and we, there are opportunities to really change those today, and that's great. But it takes a little bit of a 30,000 foot view in saying, why don't we get to the heart of the problem? Why don't we address the mutation itself? And frankly, that required high throughput screens and medicinal chemistry that most academics don't have the capacity to engage in. And that's why, frankly, our founders are a rather remarkable collection of scientists. So Jim Spudich has developed incredible assays that can track the movement of the sarcomere through all of its intricate cycles in terms of calcium activation, myosin-actin interactions, ATPase, and the like. And he can do that with exquisite precision in a test tube in a laboratory. Leslie Linewan has made protein from human sarcomere material. Okay? She has developed the technology to produce not mouse myosins and mouse actin, but human myosin and introduce those mutations. And so what this is is a wonderful collection of scientists who have discovered mutations, who can put them into cells and produce large quantities of proteins, and then who can assay the proteins and say, that makes too much power, that makes too little power. That's what we bring to this company. And so the strong underpinnings of science, I think, have been critical in terms of bringing this to fruition. And then while from the outside, we're, we're looking at, you know, we're anxious for a product. We're now to that stage where we're going to start seeing products. Absolutely, without a doubt. Myocardia is committed to it. We have the backing and the resources to make it happen. And as I say, first in man studies are ongoing as we speak. Well, it is exciting. and. Uh, I love my job because I get to talk to the most interesting <laughs> people in the world about what they're passionate about. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, in CardioSource World News, you'll find uh, this interview and a variety of other stories from AHA and from uh, other meetings. Please check us out and the uh, please the Heart Trek article from uh, Deborah Beck. For our CardioSource World News, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire. <laughs>